Exodus chapter number 28. <clears throat> Going to begin reading verse number 6. The Bible says, And they shall make the ephod of gold and blue and purple of scarlet and fine twined linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod, for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Now, at this point in the book of Exodus, God's already delivered the children of Israel from Egypt. That's what Exodus means, the going out. Now they're in the wilderness. And God's in the process of instituting what we would call Old Testament worship for the children of Israel. He's given them instructions for the tabernacle. He's given them instructions for the Ark of the Covenant. He's delivered the Ten Commandments and more of the law unto Moses. And as everything's going along, you you study out all the instructions that God gives to the children of Israel. He's very detailed. He's very specific. And that, I mean here, verse number 6, he says, this ephod that they're going to make, make it out of gold, of blue and purple, of scarlet, and fine twine linen. Nothing else. No more, no less. God knew exactly what he wanted it to look like, and what's he doing? He's telling Moses what he wants it to look like so that Moses can go out and tell the craftsmen. And just because of the way that God does things, you would say, this is some very detailed work. You, somebody that hadn't done this before, they can't go out and you know, make fine twine linen and weave it with gold and blue and scarlet and purple. And You're right. But you find that when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he just happened to have somebody trained already in all of the positions that he needed. You go and study it, and there was a old Hebrew boy somewhere that knew exactly what needed to be known in order to make everything for the tabernacle that God is instructing them here. They had master craftsmen. They had people that knew how to work with hammered gold. They knew had people that were the best seamstresses or what weavers I guess I don't know but everybody knew the cunning work as verse number I believe it was 7 told us that it should be done with cunning work meaning the best the smartest the person that was able to do the best job ought to be the one that was putting everything together so what God expect he expected the best now, if you go study out the ingredients or the materials that God said to use for this ephod, beginning in verse number 6, it says that it sh the ephod should be made first of fine twine linen. Well, linen doesn't come from an animal. It comes from a plant. Linen, if you go and do a little bit of reading what you got to do is you got to go take a specific type of plant and you've got to grab it in the right time of year as you take that plant during the right time of year it looks a little bit like sugar cane looks a little bit like bamboo almost but you take that plant and it's got the hard outer shell like bamboo or sugar cane and you must crush it and you've got to crush it thoroughly because inside of that wall or the thick outer shell of that plant there are long fibers that's what the plant uses in order to suck up water from the bottom all the way up to the top 
But you need those fibers in order to make linen. But see, fine twine linen means you've got the best of the best. It's not something that you just take together and you throw on a spinning wheel, right, just to get everything bound together to where it won't fall off. Nope. Fine twine linen means that you meticulously twine it together so that it's even throughout. That it has the same repeating pattern in the twine. If you were to put it under a microscope, you'd see the exact same detail at the beginning as you would see at the very end. Fine twine linen. That means that everything's not only woven together properly, it means that it was done the same from the start all the way to the end. And it's so fine that its craftsmanship is above reproach. You say, now why is that important? Well, because God expects consistency from his followers, one. Two, God expects you to be concerned about the details. But fine twined linen always comes out the same color, white. You don't have to bleach it. Don't have to stain it. Don't have to get it to change its color. It comes out exactly the same color that God wanted it to be. He said to add gold, blue, purple, scarlet to it. He said, make it out of fine twine linen, but add these colors to it. What's that mean? means that it was white, but then it was decorated on the outside. The fine twine linen is exactly what God wanted it to be. And then he said, add these things to it. Well, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? When God saved you, you were exactly what God wanted you to be. You got dunked in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was applied to your life, and you came out white as wool. You were exactly what God wanted you to be that day. But from that point forward, he says, we're going to add some things to you. Like what? The fruit of the Spirit. The fine twine linen still is fine as the day that you got saved, but God expects you to have some things adorning your life that identify you with Him. Well, what are those things? Well, what's a gold? Gold's always a picture of righteousness in the Bible. God expects you to be adorned with righteousness in your daily life. I might have forgotten to say this, but I was just reminded of it, so we're going to say it now. You know what the ephod was, who the ephod was worn by? The high priest. That's the only person that wore it. Well, what does God want you to be adorned with righteousness for? Well, he made you a king and a priest. We've got a high priest. His name's Jesus. He was made our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? You're a priest that can go talk to the high priest. That's why I gave you an ephod. The ephod was a garment of service. It was a garment of submission. The priest didn't put the ephod on because he wanted to put it on. The priest put the ephod on because God told him to. So that ephod was adorned with gold work throughout the fine linen. It was woven into it. It may have been attached to it. Fine twine linen still just as fine, still as twine, and still as linen as it was. It's not taken away from the fine twine, twine linen. It's adding to. What does righteousness, when you add it to your salvation, we're robed in His righteousness. Well, what's the point of that? Well, God robes you in His righteousness so that the world identifies you with Him. The gold is not for you. The gold wasn't for the priest. The gold that was adorning that ephod was to show everybody outside the temple that God's man was getting ready to head into the temple to do God's business. You know when the high priest wore the ephod when he went into that place called the Holies of Holies? That was the innermost part of the tabernacle. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was uh, kept, where it resided amongst the children of Israel. The very testament of what God had promised to them, it was the Ark of the Covenant. It was the proof to Israel that God made the promise to them that He did. Okay, it had the mercy seat on top. That's where the 
blood sacrifice was supplied once a year to push back the sins of all the people. They knew that if the high priest was wearing that linen ephod adorned with gold, they knew he was getting ready to do business. They knew that God said something was up. But why are we to be adorned with righteousness in our lives? We're supposed to be adorned with righteousness so that when people see us, they know that there is a standard and it's not on this earthly plane. No, no, I didn't add this gold to myself. I didn't even make this fine twine linen that I'm wearing. God added this to me because I couldn't add it to myself. The standard is not me or you or Trump or Bill Gates or any other person that you want to measure up to. The standard is Christ. And I couldn't get there on my own, so he's just letting me borrow some right now. But then, let's start with the last color, scarlet. We were made white as wool, but the blood still is scarlet today as it was the day that it was shed. It'll never run out, the psalmist, or the songwriter told us. It'll never lose its power, hallelujah. But see, even after you put that white ephod on occasionally, you've got to go back and confess your sins and He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. How's that cleansing process go? You've got to have more scarlet applied to you. If you know where to find some scarlet, that means that you can tell somebody else how they can be cleansed. The scarlet identifies you with what purified you. Yeah, we've got a bloody religion because without the blood of Jesus, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. That wasn't our rule, that was God's rule. Because from the day that Adam and Eve chose to sin forward, God had to keep killing in order to cover up what they had done. And it didn't cover it up permanently, it covered it up for a season. If you go get a piece of leather, turn it into a coat, it'll last for a while. But eventually it's going to rub through. We've got these things called calluses that are real good at cutting through things. Okay, I don't know how I did it, Seth, but while asleep, okay, while sleeping, somehow my feet cut through my bed sheet. I don't know how that happened. Okay? My feet do not look like prehistoric riverbeds, okay? They're not rough and jagged, but yet somehow just the friction of skin on a bed sheet was enough to cut through a bed sheet. So now I got to go buy more bed sheet. And I got to buy the special kind because the last time I bought it, I was like, oh, we're going to go up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy nights. And I got it on sale. Luckily, it's Memorial Day weekend. I think they were on sales like that online. So it might have been just the perfect time, Brother Peter. But I got to buy the kind that go with the bed that I got now. And I can't just go out and say, uh, give me that one. Right? I've become spoiled, Brother Ed. Anyway. How'd you do that? I don't know. But this flesh, it's real irritating. To those things that try to cover it up. What happened to all that, those animal sacrifices that were meant to be a picture of what Christ would do? None of them lasted. Any of y'all in here today still wearing the same shoes that you had a decade ago? If so, you took real good care of them shoes. Or you're a lady and you got 900 pairs of them and you only wore them four times in the past decade. Okay? Could be that. What are you saying, Brother George? If you use things, they wear out. And in fact, it takes a lot of hard work and effort to keep things that you use from wearing out. What's that scarlet color show that the things of God never wear out and that you've staked your faith, you've identified yourself with that scarlet color? Robed in His righteousness, but that scarlet's something that you choose to adorn yourself with. You have to identify yourself by choice with the perfect slain lamb of glory that scarlet color is what makes you stand out as one of his there's a lot of people that say well I'm wearing white and it's all smoke and mirrors it's not really white there's a lot of people that are adorning themselves with precious baubles but there's very few people that will say this blood, this scarlet is what made the difference for me well then what's that purple 
Purple in the Bible is always a picture of royalty. Well, you say, Brother Jordan, that, that royalty, we're not royal. Nope. But not only did he make you a, peace, uh, a priest, he made you a king. You know what kings wear? Purple. Go study in the Hall of Praetorium what did they adorn him with? They adorned him with a purple garment to mock him because they said he said he was the king of kings. Now he didn't say that. God the Father said that. And Pilate believed it so much that he went and had it inscribed on the piece of wood and he had it hung above his head on the cross the Jews got real angry they said no don't put there that he is put that he said that he was Pilate said I've written what I've written he found no fault in him what's that purple color represent a whole lot of effort went into putting that color into that garment I don't know if you've ever heard our pastor preach on it but Back in Bible days, to get the color purple, there was only one way that you could make a dye that was one consistent, it was permanent, and that it was going to come out the color that was desirable. Because people don't want to wear it, there's no sense in making it. There was only one surefire way to make the color purple back in biblical days. There was a special worm. And if you took that worm and you crushed it, then you mixed many worms together. Eventually you would get enough to make a dye that clothes could be submerged in. Very labor intensive process. But more importantly, it was a small quantity. That's why only the rich or the powerful could afford that scarlet, that I'm not scarlet, the violet color, that purple color. That's why silk was so expensive for so many years because the only worms that made silk were in the Orient. And the Silk Road was the only way to get it. And it had to come a long distance before it got to you. And then what happened? Some booger got over there and bought about two of them, made sure that one was a male and one was a female. And by the time he got back to Europe with them, he had a whole bunch of silkworms. He cut out the middleman. But well, how did you make purple? You had to find somebody that knew where the right worms were. You had to wait for the worms to repopulate. Because if you used all the worms, there wasn't going to be no worms left. You had to take them and you had to, you know, willfully destroy them so that you might have something else. That purple color is an identifier that, yes, we are made kings and priests with Him. But in order for us to become royalty, He had to become pressed, poured out for us. Yes, it identifies us as royalty, but it shows how painful and how thorough the process of Christ bearing your sins and my sin were applied to him. That color purple means if you think that I'm anything, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But the only reason I've gotten to where I'm at is because of what he went through for me. What he still endures to this day because of his long suffering and mercies towards me. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. And I wonder if we ever stop to consider how much grace and mercy God has to pour out on purpose every day to keep us adorned the way that we ought to be because we still live in sin. We're unrepentant. We're rebellious. We're unconcerned with what the Father's concerned with, but yet He still lets us wear the outfit. But the last one's that color blue. Blue was always a picture of an heir, a prince. The blue mixed with the purple. That meant they'd use royalty, but one day use next in line. Well, how much does God think about you? The blue is for you as much as it is for anybody else. You look down and you don't have a problem with the scarlet. We thank God for the scarlet. We thank God for the purple. But every now and then, it just blows our mind that we are joint heirs with Christ. That means you own everything that He owns. God put the blue on you so that you'd remember that He made you that promise. Really, the blue is a reminder of everything that God promised to you. It's not just that you're a prince. 
you're a king and a priest. No, you own everything that Jesus owned. Because in order for you to get in the family, he had to graft you into the vine. You know what that means? He chose you on purpose. And he was willing to give up what was rightfully his so that you could be a partaker. All the promises in the Bible, you're adorned with a color that reminds you he, he really did promise it to you. The blue is that when you look down, you think he meant it just as much today as he did yesterday, and he's going to mean it just as much tomorrow. The blue is an identifier that God has not forgotten you. God knows exactly where you are. And he, because you're a prince, he puts you there on purpose. The heir doesn't get cast to the dogs. He doesn't get thrown in the middle of a battle that's too big for him. No, the prince is well taken care of. You know where you are today? Exactly where God wanted you to be. He knew exactly where you'd be on this day. And because of that, he already a long time ago took precautions. He made provisions. Because he knew that you'd be right where you are today. And when you look down and you see that blue, you remember, God knows where I'm at. God knows where I'll be tomorrow, even though I don't. But he chose me on purpose, which means he has a purpose for me. As David said, he knows the way that I take. Even though I may not, he does. And he'll not see me destroyed without a purpose. Christ endured the cross. Why? So that the Father could have many sons. Not just one son. That by one son, many sons would come to him. That's what the Bible says. Well, if I suffer today, it might just be because God wants to robe somebody else in blue and purple and scarlet today. But it'll all be worth it in the end. Well, that's the symbology, if you will, of the ephod garment. We're not going to talk about any of that for the rest of the Sunday school. But it is a good analogy. That's why the Old Testament was given to us as our insample, as our schoolmaster, our teacher. God's way change not. What he robed the priest with back then, same thing he's robing priests with today. Himself. With his mercy, with his grace, with his love. But there's one more thing, verse number 12, that went on this ephod. There was a breastplate that went over the ephod, but the breastplate wasn't attached to the ephod. But in verse number 12 it says, And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod. What that mean? It means that it was attached permanently. It didn't go in the breastplate that they made, as it said, ockets or sockets, pockets, for these two stones to go into. They made a way. Just like jewelers today make a way with gold that... There was a setting that once you put the stone in and you set it, it ain't going anywhere. Again, permanency. What did God tell them to put in two onyx or two black stones with the names of the children of Israel engraved into them? Not scratched onto them, not written onto them, no. Carved out of these black stones. Six names on this stone, six names on that stone, and one on each shoulder. Those onyx stones can represent what the children of Israel were on their own. They were black, sinful. In fact, don't know if you've ever seen an onyx stone or you've seen black marble. If it is a smooth black material that you're working with, if you etch those names out, it's still real hard to make them out. Because there's nothing that separates the black of a perfectly smooth onyx stone from anything else. It's all black. Doesn't matter which angle you look at it. Doesn't matter which way the sun's looking at it. Black is black. You shut the lights out, it doesn't matter how colorful what you had on before was. If you get it submerged in black, in darkness, you can't see it. You could be up close to somebody not even know it. 
Because in darkness, everything is dark. But he said, no, engrave their names into it. That's a picture of God reached way down where they were and chose to pull them out. Not just of Egypt, but way back when he made that promise to Abraham that he'd make a chosen generation out of them. What did he do? He reached down and he picked exactly them out of the muck and mire. Well, what do you do when you got saved? The part of you that used to be left in the black, he engraved that out. He took every last bit of you out of the muck and the mire. He cleaned you up and he set you on the solid rock. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? There's a place in hell, right? Metaphorically, if you will, that the devil had your name stamped on. He said, one day that's going to be there. One day hell's going to have to enlarge its borders and they're going to need a spot right there to put that person. Well, what happened? God reached down and he plucked that part of hell out. There's a spot in the devil's mind where you should go, but God took you out of it. That engraved. Once you engrave something, you can't put it back. Go study all the monuments in Washington, D.C. Go study, if you will, all of those marble and uh, what's it, the limestone buildings on college campuses. Once it's engraved, you can't put it back. Once you lob it out, you can't take that dust and turn it back into rock. That engraving shows the permanency of it. God's not planning on you going back to where He found you from. That's why He engraved you out. There's nothing left to tie you to where you were. He made you free. In fact, if you look back, you can see where you once were, but you know that you can't go back. You don't fit no more. He's done a work on you. You can see where you used to be, but you also know, I can't go back if I wanted to. So those two stones on the shoulders, notice. You go through here, you're going to find the word memorial. We'll get there. Don't get ahead of me. Focus. You'll find the word memorial several times in this chapter, but in verse number 12, he says that those two stones on the ephod right, shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel. It says, And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Why did God tell them to carve them names out of them two stones? Why did he tell them to attach it to the ephod, the priest's garment? Why was it so important for God to do this? It wasn't for God. Just because you put two stones on you and it's got some names carved into it doesn't mean that you're any more righteous. It doesn't make you anything special. But God said He did it not for Him. He said as a memorial unto the children of Israel. So that every time they saw the high priest, in this case Aaron, every time he went into that holy of holies, when God looked down from heaven to where he was, everywhere that Aaron went, everything that Aaron did when God saw it, the children of Israel would know that he's looking at Aaron, but he sees all of us. Well, what happens when Christ looks at me? Or when God looks at me, sees Christ? When I enter into the throne room of God as a priest to take my petitions and my prayers right to the throne room of God, when he looks at me, he sees the name that was carved into me. Jesus. But why does he see me? And Jesus is the same person because a long time ago on a hill called Calvary there was the rock of ages that was hung on Calvary. And with crude tools they took and they hammered nails and thrust a spear into his side. And on that day into the rock of ages Christ carved my name out. I've got his name on me because my name's engraved in the palms of his hands. He bears my name in his side where they thrust him through and in his feet. So everywhere that I go, there's a rock that God's got associated with you and me. That rock is Jesus. And when the Father looks at Jesus, he says, their name's right here. So his name is engraved into me down here. 
It was a memorial for the children of Israel that there wasn't any place that Aaron could go that God would forget about. Even though Aaron was in there, he was there, but he was there as all of Israel. And God cared about all of Israel so much that he made it a part of the very clothing that he wore. Made it in pockets, as the Bible calls it. What does that mean? There was a place made that only those stones could fit, and they weren't coming out after they were put in there. Now what are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that tomorrow's Memorial Day. As I was thinking about Memorial Day, used to, they would teach you the importance of Memorial Day when you was in school. Around my time, they had kind of slacked and were basically doing it superficially. I'm an oddball. I like history. I go and I find stuff out like that because I know those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I'm also believing in the fact that God gave us a time and a place where information is fed. Why? So that you can know what is good and what is not good in the eyes of God. There is wisdom and much counsel as long as it's godly counsel. Well, you can go in history and you can see all the nations that rose up and then God said, nope, you're going to fall. You can see the ones that he raised up to do a certain deed at a certain time to a certain goal. But Memorial Day, the reason that we celebrate it, for those that don't know, it is a testament. And all across this country, all across this globe, you can go from Anzio in France all the way to hills in South Korea and there are battlefields in Australia and throughout Southeast Asia some in South America there are stones that are erected that have men's names carved out of them and that's a memorial and a testament to their honor their bravery and their sacrifice for our country I remember, I think I was seven years old the summer of 2000. We went to Washington, D.C. In my mind, I could still remember standing in front of the Vietnam Memorial with my grandfather who served there. I talk a lot. That's not something new. It's been that way for a long time. Before we went to the Vietnam Memorial, I remember them telling me, you shut your mouth and you don't open it until we say so. I knew it was a very solemn thing. And I didn't understand everything that was going Why there were so many people that were bringing flowers and laying them down at certain pillars. I didn't know at the time that there was essentially an entire slate that half of it was men that my grandfather served with. I didn't understand that because he was a sergeant, a lot of those men lost their lives when he was in charge. I didn't know that my grandfather's childhood best friend had his name engraved on that slate. I didn't know that when he got back, that best friend's mother blamed my grandfather for her boy not coming home. I didn't understand all that then. But I knew there was something special about them names that were engraved. And I dare say until Jesus comes back, all of those men are going to have their names engraved in permanent stone as a testament and a reminder of what they gave for our country that we might have what we have today. But see, the reason that Memorial Day for some people is just another holiday to go out and get drunk is because they've never associated what they have with what it costs somebody else. There are many places in the Bible that God sets up monuments and memorials. And he did it, not for him, but for them. You know why God carved the names out of rock? Because you can't fill in rock with anything else and make it into more rock. You could take all the bondo you want to and put it on a car, it's still not going to be metal even after it gets hard. Yeah, you could take all the clear tape that you want to and try and tape a cracked picture frame back together but that tape's not glass there's always going to be a void there 
There's always going to be proof that something was removed. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? It doesn't matter how much this world beats you down and tries to cast you into the dirt. Every time God picks you up and dusts you off, there's still proof that He took something out of you that you couldn't take out yourself. And He replaced it with Himself. But do you understand the process of you having the Holy Ghost indwelling you? What that cost Christ? In order to add Himself to you, He had to remove from Himself. There's a plate. The only thing in heaven, as the songwriter said, very poetic, but it's also very powerful. The only man-made thing in heaven are going to be them nail prints in Jesus' hands, the wound in his side made by that spear, and in the wounds in his feet. But in truth, man did not make those wounds. God allowed them to be made. Jesus could have said the word and everything would have ceased to have existed. I'm not talking about saying the word and angels come down and take them off the cross. No. We, all things by Him and through Him consist. He could have had the thought and everything would have ended. But yet He allowed it to happen. Why? Love. Why are there men that have served and their names are engraved in monuments because they had a love for this country? And when push came to shove, they loved their family, they loved their nation, they loved their country more than they loved themselves. They chose to do it. But what are you saying, Brother Jordan? Jesus loved you on purpose. He chose to do it. And in your heart, whether you realize it or not, when He saved you, He cut away that sin nature I believe that when he cut it away, might have said love. Might have been your new name that's written down that we don't know yet. I do know that will be known as we're known now. But I don't know. Champ knows that I call him Champ. I have no idea what Champ calls me in his head. They got a name for me. It's probably the hairy one, right? But you don't know what God calls you. Audibly. But you know what it sounds like when He says your name. You know why that is? Because He's hollowed out a spot in you that He filled with Himself on the day you got saved. You said, Lord, I'm not enough. He said, don't worry about it. I got the perfect solution. What is it? It's Him. But see, all throughout your life, we can go and we can study Joshua where they crossed the river Jordan into Canaan land after Moses died he's in glory as they're crossing that river when they committed their foot to the water the bearers of the ark of the covenant the waters parted and out there in the middle of this river Joshua starts taking some rocks and he builds what a memorial so that everybody that walked by said hey there was a time that the water right there it wasn't water God parted it well how do you know that because way out in the middle of the Ohio river there's a big formation of rocks How'd they get there? Well, man walked on that dirt. Man set up them rocks, and then after God put the water back, the rocks have stayed there. What is it? It was a testament of the fact that God had done something. All throughout your life, you've got memorials. Places where God committed hammer and chisel to remove something, but it still stands as a testament today of either how far you've come, what God's done for you that you couldn't do for yourself. And every time He carves something out, what's it do? It makes it more memorable. They tell me that the diamonds that are worth the most, worth of the most are the ones that have the most facets on them. You know what a facet is? That's a cut. When they grind that stone down, the more facets, the more it glitters, the more it gleams. Well, every time that the Lord puts hammer and chisel to you, it's not to hurt you. The more facets it has, the less light it takes in order for it to gleam. Some things, in order to see if it's real, you got to put it right under a spotlight. But where's God thought, told us to go to? He said, go out to the dark. Go out to those that have no light. 
And all it takes is a little bit of light in order for you to start glittering. Because there's not much light out there. What's that take? The Lord's got to add some facets to you. He's got to take away from you in order to make you worth more. You say, well, that doesn't make sense, Brother Jordan. Well, it takes a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of time to put those facets on there and to make sure that they're square and that you're not going to scratch the outside of the diamond. All that labor and all that hands-on effort, that means that the price tag goes up. You can have a much bigger diamond, but if it's not cut and polished, nobody wants it. They want the one that the master's had his hands on. That you can turn it every which way and know that the master did some good handiwork. That's why it's worth more. Well, every one of those facets is a memorial of the fact that God took something that you thought was valuable and he replaced it with himself. And now, you're worth more than you ever could have been before. Those memorials are meant to be permanent. They're meant to stand. They're meant to stay in the test of time. The test of weather. The test of everything that the world can throw at it. You know why they're meant to stay? Because there's some things that are worth remembering. There's some things that we ought not let people forget. Even if they never knew why or who or what it was, they know that there's something special about what's engraved on the side of that monument and if it piques their curiosity they can go and they can research it themselves there are still things written in ancient Latin all across Rome today why? because somebody hammered it out with a hammer and chisel they did it on purpose well see there are things in your life that God's removed he's chiseled he's turned into a memorial of himself so that other people see it and say what's that mean? I don't read a ancient Latin don't read Hebrew or Greek either barely read English pretty good a hillbilly though but you see something and you think what's that mean it meant enough to somebody that they went through all the effort to make a memorial to make a monument but what's your life supposed to be it's supposed to be a living breathing monument to what Christ did in your life we take a day here to memorialize those that paid the ultimate price there's veterans day those are the ones that came back memorial day is the ones that stayed there they get their own day why do you think God gets his own day throughout the week because Christ gave himself for you every Sunday is a memorial of what Christ did for us not of what we can do for him And his name ought to be etched into the fleshy tables of our hearts. It ought to be adorned about us. That when people see us, they associate us with him as a memorial of what his love and his kindness and his grace and his mercy did for us. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.